from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Ellen McCulloch Lovell, and I'm the president of Marlboro College, which is a small liberal arts college in southern Vermont that was started in 1946 from two by three veterans returning from World War II. I'm also the former director of the Veterans History Project, and I'm so happy and proud to be here today, to see all of you, to honor all of you, to see what's happened at this reunion, to be here with my mother and wife of Lieutenant Colonel Ronald McCullough and my uncle, Sarah McCullough, my uncle Huey, who is in the infantry with the 86th Black Hawk Division. A very proud day for all of us and for our very good friends on this panel. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Veterans History Project because this is going to be going on for days and I'm, I want you to know that we want your stories now, the next day, or in the months coming ahead. We're so happy to be joining with the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage and the American Battle Monuments Commission, which is doing this huge event on the Mall through Sunday. The Veterans History Project is a project of the Library of Congress and its American Folklife Center. It was created by Congress in 2000 because they felt so strongly that the first-hand accounts of war veterans from all 20th century wars should be saved, should not be lost. And fortunately, AARP came along as our main corporate sponsor. And so that's how it got off the ground. It's also the largest roundup of first-hand personal accounts since the days of the WPA. And that attempt to fan out all over the country and collect ghost stories. And it is the first national project that uses volunteers. And some of our volunteers are here today, and some of our star volunteers have interviewed 50 and 75 and 100 veterans for us. We collect tape-recorded interviews, video, uh, videoed interviews, letters, photographs, and your written memoirs, and we love to have them all. And these are very precious memories that will be preserved in the Library of Congress. If you give us your wartime memories, they'll be saved with 70,000 other items representing almost 20,000 individual stories. For those of you who want to share your stories online by computer, you'll see the computer stands over there. If you want to sign up for an interview, please sign up over here because we're taking live interviews. And all over the mall, you're going to see our roving volunteers in these purple shirts and purple hats. And they'll come up and ask you to share your wartime memories with them um, on a, uh, a tape recorder. So we hope that very much, very much that you'll do that. If you want to see and hear other veteran stories, go online, go to www.loc.gov slash vets. Ask any of the volunteers around the perimeter to help you, you and you can go on and hear the stories such as Tracy Sugarman's and uh, Willis Corbett's, who was pointed out in the session before. And remember, we're collecting from all veterans and civilians who served. So if you were a war industry worker, if you were a nurse or a nurse's aide, if you were in the wax or the waves, if you helped a dockside, if you were on the home front or the front lines, we want your story. Men and women and all branches, Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and the U.S. Coast Guard and the Merchant Marine. So we invite you to help us create this national collection and join the thousands of partners all over the country who are doing this. So these stories are preserved and they can teach the next generation about service and what that is all about. And now you're going to hear some remarkable stories of service. And the moderator of this panel is Bob Babcock. He's with Americans Remembered one of our most active partners from Atlanta, Georgia. And Bob, I think you've done almost 100 interviews yourself? Yes, ma'am. That's right. So please welcome Bob Babcock and these amazing individuals who were in our D-Day. 
Thank you, Ellen. And all of you should know that Ellen was the original director of the Veterans History Project, so she's the lady that started this off. So we've got a lot to thank her. She's moved on now as president of a small college up in New England. But today's topic is D-Day stories. And as most of you think of D-Day, you think of June 6, 1944, and that's what we're going to talk about. But there were many other D-Days in World War II and in subsequent wars. D-Day means the day unknown yet when an invasion would happen, and H hour is the unknown hour when they will actually hit within D-Day. Just out of interest, how many in our audience today participated in any D-Day, whether it be North Africa, Sicily, Italy, Pacific, Southern France, Normandy. Would you all raise your hand, any D-Day vets? Raise it up high, be proud of it. There we go. Outstanding. What Today on our panel, we're going to talk about the D-Day that we're coming up on the 60th anniversary a week from Sunday on June 6th. And the map up here on, our, on my right, your left, shows the assault. And if you will look to your left on the map, the first beach is Utah Beach, where the 4th Infantry Division landed. And the airborne troops from 101st Airborne and 82nd Airborne jumped in behind Utah Beach. The next beach over is Omaha Beach, where the 29th Division and the 1st Infantry Division landed. But there were lots of other people involved in D-Day besides those divisions. So today we've got a unique blend. On my right, we have Brigadier General Retired Al Ungerleiter, who is our infantry representative. He landed with the 115th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division on Omaha Beach, so we'll hear his story. Sitting next to me on my left, we have a representative from the Navy. Tracy Sugarman was an ensign responsible for the landing crafts. So he was on Utah Beach bringing troops ashore. In fact, he was there from D-Day for a long time, and he'll tell you about that later. And then also making sure this was a combined arm operation, we had the Army Air Corps involved. And on my far left is Bob Punchy Powell, who flew P-51s on D-Day and for 81 other missions. Uh, and it's interesting, out of the three panelists and myself, Tracy wrote a book that is very interesting called My War, because he was also a, an, is also an artist and a sketch, sketch artist and has done great work. This book is out of print, so used bookstores is the only place you can find it. Bob wrote a book, The Blue-Nosed Bastards of Bodney. Once again, out of print, but you can find it in used bookstores, about a thousand pictures in this book. And I wrote a book called War Stories, Utah Beach to Play Coup, and we have about 100 pages of 4th Infantry Division Utah Beach stories. Again, this book's out of print. So if you want to look for any of these books, they're on used bookstores. Now, Let's talk about what happened. D-Day was supposed to have happened on June 5th, so let's find out. First, General Ungleider, how was it when you heard out that you were going to go and this was D-Day? Okay. All right. Good afternoon. I told him that I can't speak sitting down. I, not, not before an audience. activated to go to war and uh, 
They did a good job. They did as well, I might say, as any of the regular Army divisions that landed on those beaches. So the 29th goes down in history as being the only National Guard division to land on the 6th of June on the beaches of Normandy. All the rest are regular divisions and supposedly better trained and better manned than a National Guard division. But believe you me, we showed them that the National Guard can fight as well as the regular army. We proved it to them. Amen. So, what was the beaches look like where we landed? I'm not familiar with all the beaches of the world, but it was sandy and it looked like a beach. So, uh, we knew we're in the right place. As Bob mentioned, we were originally supposed to go in on 5 June of 1944, but because of the rough seas, and we were out in those rough seas on these small boats, and boy, we were getting sicker all the time. But they held it off till the 6th, which was less rough, but still, it was a choppy sea to go in for any landing. But, we made it all right, and we're able to fight our way against a determined group of Germans who were defending those beaches. We had artillery support, and we had, best of all, naval gunfire support. I don't know how many Navy people were here, but I gained more respect for our United States Navy on that day in 1944. They did a marvelous job of getting us on the beach and uh, seeing that we're well supported by gunfire after we get on the beach. I don't know why they picked out the, the area that we went in on, but it certainly was not an easy objective. To land on the beach which was flat for about 300 or 400 meters, and then it started getting hillier and more forester, and uh, we uh, knew that we were in for a tough battle because the Germans were able to hide behind the trees and down in foxholes. But again, Navy guns and fire support, whenever we needed it, was available to us and was, came in in large quantity to where it made our job a little bit easier. We did lose men on going in, but not very many. A lot of thanks goes to the Navy. What did we find when we got on this beach? We, we knew what we were going to find. But as I said, it was sandy for about 400 yards, and then heavily wooded for quite a distance inland from there. So we used our artillery as best we could, not to so much to hit the beach itself, because we had uh, mortars and machine guns that we could take care of the beach, but the fire in the woodland and fire beyond to keep any reinforcements from reaching us on their own time schedule. And that seemed to work. We were able to get in. Slow going though, through the heavy growth, and sometimes our progress was made, measured by a few hours of the day that we were able to advance. Other times it was a little more open to where we could move a little bit faster. But I don't know if you've ever tried seeing through a woodland, a forest. It's not easy, and we were not thing. But we had thousands and thousands of men behind us, shipload after shipload of men ready to come in as needed. Our job was to make it easier for them and make it easier for ourselves. But uh, 
D-Day Normandy, that, that section of Normandy where we landed was rough terrain. The Germans had taken good advantage of the terrain. They had deep foxholes. Some branched off to where they were able to live down there, eat down there, and then come up into their foxhole when it was time to shoot something. So we did all this, and uh, as I said, it was no speed race, we had a slow going, going in. When we finally cleared where the, the woodland was and we came to open area, that was our objective, to gain the land through this woodland and then stop there. And then wait for the reinforcements. This is what we did. And then the open land that was behind the woodland was heavily shelled every time U.S. forces met, mounted the attack. The question was, could we hold on to this foothold that we had gained on the beaches of Normandy. And again, it was very tenuous because we were not in that far. If the Germans had mounted any kind of attack, counterattack of any kind, it would have been rough for us to hold on and, and beat them back. For some reason, and I don't know why to this day, and I'll bet the, I don't know what the Germans are teaching in their school, military schools as to why they didn't counterattack. It will never be known to me. It was ideal for them because, of, as I said, open land moving into a woodland. They could have shelled that woodland day and night until we were groggy and then attacked. But for some reason, they didn't do it, whether they felt that the end of the war was not too far off, I don't know. But uh, the fact that they didn't counterattack saved the day for the Americans and saved the day for the Allied forces to gain that foothold on this land so that they could start their march across Europe. Sir, appreciate that. As we all see from these things, we could talk for a long time. In the short time we have, I'm going to have to stop now. We've heard the ground for a bit. We're going to move on. This is the part, hard part about being a moderator. I love listening to these stories, but we don't have time to go on and on. So why don't, let's stop your story now. We'll come back to you later. So let's talk now, because while, as General Ungerleiter said, the Navy he got great respect for. and. I think everybody had great respect for the Navy. So for next, I'd like to hear from Tracy Sugarman, who was on Utah Beach, the beach off on the far end, not on the same beach where General Ungerleiter was. Tracy, talk about your experiences. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting to, to come to a point in your life where, where you, you have become history. And uh, <laughs> we all feel a little bit like relics. Okay. I think we, uh, we may be relics, but we do uh, own a lot of very green memories of times when we were really very young. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to realize that when you look at the old timers like uh, those of us up on the stage, that when we were doing what we're being celebrated for, that we were 21, we were 22 or 23 years old. Uh, I was a small boat officer in charge of LCVPs, which were those open-ended boats that you saw in Saving Private Ryan. And our main mission the mission of the boats that I was in charge of was to carry army people like General Ungerleiter and those, those guys who had to then wade out from our boats, sometimes in five and six feet of water, under heavy packs, uh, even with uh, uh, gear against gas, because at that point we weren't sure whether the Germans we're going to gas the beaches. 
And to watch those army guys wade ashore and then fight their way from the beaches uh, made memories for me that I'll never forget. Um, they are enormously uh, brave people who fight our wars. And what I think is good for everybody here to remember and to note even today is the kids who are fighting for us are kids. Those are kids, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. And we should feel for them and we should support them in every way we can. I was uh, enormously grateful uh, for the army <laughs> that, that I carried ashore to carry on the fighting. I was enormously grateful also for people like Bob over here who were flying air support over our beach. If those guys were not doing their job, our, our job on the beach would have been enormously more difficult. And the fact that the Germans did not show up often didn't mean they didn't show up at all. We were strafed on the beach, my boats were shot up, happily none of my men were lost. But the Germans were there, German 88 shells kept landing on Utah Beach on and off for weeks after D-Day. Uh, I hit the beach on D-Day uh, and was assigned to port direction of Utah Beach and I was on that damn beach until November when I closed it with two other junior officers and I was never so happy to leave a square yard of, of, of sand. Uh, I'd seen a lot of death, a lot of destruction, a lot of bravery on one little piece of beach. And one little piece of beach is all that I ever really saw of the war in combat. But I saw it in enough depth to know it's a good thing not to have if you can avoid one. I'd like to talk uh, a lot more, but I don't think have that much time. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and let me put in a little commercial for those of you listening right now, because Tracy, I think, said it very well. Every person had a small slice of beach or a small slice of forest or a small slice of the home front, and every one of you have a thread in the mosaic that makes up American history in World War II. It is critically important that each of those threads get woven and preserved into this mosaic so future generations can understand what the greatest generation did for us. So, I don't care how insignificant you think your job might have been, you deserve to tell it, and we as a country deserve to hear it. Now, let's talk about, we've heard from the ground, we've heard from the sea, and now we've got the guys flying around in their P-51s. Bob Punchy Powell is a man that I interviewed for the Veterans History Project a little over a year and a half ago and I've been fascinated with him ever since. So, Punchy, talk about the 16 hours you spent on D-Day. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. D-Day, uh, as you know, was called the longest day, and for me it was a long day also, and for our group. I was very privileged to fly with the, an outstanding fighter group, the 352nd Fighter Group. We were called the Blue Nose Bastards of Bodney by the Germans. The, uh, on on D-Day morning, uh, we came, we, uh, we took off, at, made a night takeoff, which we had never done in combat. Our, we, we went out by squadrons. We had three squadrons, and each squadron went out about an hour apart. And we spent, we, our first mission was to put up a wall of airplanes, a total wall of airplanes from treetop level to 30,000 feet. No German fighter pilot in Luftwaffe had the nerve to try to come through that wall. Our second mission, by the way, we had up over a thousand fighters at that time. One of our biggest dangers was running into each other. But on our second mission, our mission was a little different. 
We were told that the French people had been advised not to get on any of the roads, the highways, the roads, or anything. If they wanted to do anything, they had to go across the fields because anything that moved on the roads toward the beachheads were fair game, were targets of opportunity for us. We were each given a sector, assigned a sector that we were to patrol, and if anything moved on those roads, and I'm talking about trucks, buses, even dispatch riders on motorcycles. Anything that moved toward the beachhead was fair game. We were very successful in that. We didn't lose many airplanes. We lost a few uh, from ground fire, but not too many during that particular period. During the next several days, we lost a number of them. My group destroyed, during World War II, destroyed 776 German airplanes. Um, We had 29 aces, including the, the leading Mustang ace of World War II, George Preddy. He was killed on Christmas Day by a friendly fire. But on D-Day, most all of us flew 16 hours, three missions. And if you can imagine being in a small cockpit like a P-51 with your legs about in this position for 16 hours, with a break, of course, when you went back and refueled and rearmed. I was so stiff on my, after my third mission that I could not get out of the airplane, and I was 21 years old. My crew chief and my armorer got up on each wing and lifted me up out of the cockpit and set me down on the wing. So it was a long, grueling day. But let me say this, as we passed over the beaches, we could see the thousands of ships, I don't know how many, but they were everywhere underneath us. And we could see the men moving forward on the beaches. I had the greatest empathy and still have for the courage of those men. Compared to them, my job on D-Day was a piece of cake. At least that night, I slept in a cot. They slept in a foxhole, if they slept at all, and many of them slept forever. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. There's some very interesting perspectives, and as I've talked to these gentlemen up here, every one of them has utmost respect for the other, and I think that's what makes America such a great country, is that it takes all of us to do the job, right? As an old infantryman myself, I have absolute respect for those guys. Yeah, they get to sleep on cots, but at least we don't have to worry about running into each other up in the air like you guys do. And you guys are bringing the ships ashore. You know, we landed once. You know, Al landed once. How many times did you land? You landed a bunch of times. So everybody has a very important role. So what I want to do now and I want to throw this open to questions here in a minute, but first I just want to bounce back around for another short story. So Tracy, what, had, what didn't you tell us in your initial comments that you could tell us a short story? Bob be thinking of a short story, Al be thinking of a short story, and then we'll throw it open to your questions. Uh, the, only, the only short thing that I'd like, I'd like to bring up is good fortune, good luck. And I think anybody who's been in the service knows the, uh, the role that good fortune plays. I mean, you, can, you can play your cards as carefully as you want, but you are being moved around. You are being used and you're doing your job as well as you can. The night before D-Day on our ship, the skipper called uh, me and the other small boat officer, two youngest uh, ensigns on the ship, and he said, um, we're hitting the beach tomorrow. Only one of you is going with me. Uh, one of you is, is leaving this ship with the small boats and hitting Utah Beach. The other one is staying on the ship with me and we're going down for the invasion of Nice in southern France. And he said, I want you two guys to flip a coin and see who comes with me and who stays here in Normandy. And I flipped a coin with my buddy, and I got 
what I thought was the tough duty. I was hitting Utah Beach. He went down uh, with the ship to Nice. It was a piece of cake. It was an easy invasion. And the skipper of the ship asked him, the other small boat officer, to fly off and pick up the ship's mail in southern France. And the plane was shot down and he was lost. I went through a rough time in Normandy, but I'm here to talk to you in 2004. So good luck has an awful lot to do with coming out of a war intact. Thank you, Tracy. That is, that, that, that is a fact. Now, I think everybody can probably tell you about that there, but for the grace of God, go out, right? And you know what? I think you ought to be the mayor of Utah Beach. Nobody stayed longer on Utah than you did. I'm going to be over there next week for the 60th anniversary. I'm going to make sure the folks know that you spent more time there than anybody. Bob, give me a quick short story. Well, I just want to say that our, our first casualty on, on D-Day happened about 30 seconds after we, we gave the throttle to our, to our, the first squadron gave its throttles to take off. What, we, this was a night takeoff, and the first four airplanes to take off, we took off in, in fours, 15 feet apart, and the first airplane lined up wrong, and the, set, the third airplane struck a new tower that was being built on the field and blew up. The rest of us took off by the fire of his burning airplane. Interesting stories. Okay, now Al, give us a short story. Uh, both of my friends over here talked about a piece of cake. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of something I can tell you of interest. Omaha Beach is really a place you should visit when you go back to France. Uh, anybody in Paris will show you the way and they're very proud to show the beach because here it is 60 years later and they, the people of Normandy particularly love the Americans. Whatever you've heard about France and whatever you've heard about the, the way they've been battling our go government, don't apply that to the people of Normandy. They love the Americans. And each time, as I said, when we go back, they whine us, they dine us, they just as much as they can to help us enjoy our time while they're over there. Thank you, Al. You know, people ask me what I did on D-Day, and I was 10 months old and I don't remember. So I'm not that old, even though I may look that old. So I don't have a D-Day story to tell. Do any of you have questions? Because D-Day has been fascinating to me all my life, ever since I was wrote a term paper on it in high school. Do we have a microphone somewhere so that we can get a question or? Yeah, use this one. And we got a man right down there who has a question. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Bob Powell. Um, after D-Day, where was the first airfield that you established and landed in in Normandy? Actually my group uh, did not move over to the continent until uh, about December around the Battle of the Bulge time when we moved about 15 miles from the front lines. However, uh, because the 9th Air Force took over the ground support stuff and they, they had their airfields in France flying P-47s but we did not, uh, our, we continued to fly out of Bodney, England, and uh, both on strafing missions, strafing airports and so forth, and escorting our bombers. We went back to our primary mission, which was escorting our bombers. But when we finished escorting the bombers, if we were not out of fuel and not out of ammunition, we would go down and shoot up airfields and trains and trucks and anything else that might help the Germans against us. Does anyone else have a question? Right down here. 
Uh, this is for Tracy Sugarman. Uh, Tracy, we, we heard you give the uh, proper tribute to all who participated on the home front as well as overseas, but could you share with us a little about your personal experience? You had a new bride back in the States. The kids on your ship were very young. How important really was support for you and them from this family on the home front? It was uh, absolutely total. Uh, getting mail from home uh, was all the difference in, in, in whether you made it comfortably through a day or a night again. Uh, it was vital. And that's uh, very interesting that you bring that up. Uh, what mail meant during World War II, it may be very hard to comprehend to, to a young audience. Uh, when my wife, June, my new bride, would write me a letter, if it found me at all, it took two weeks to get to me. I would answer it, and if it was any luck at all, two weeks later, she got it. Meanwhile, she had been writing every day, I had been writing every day, and by the time you got an answer to a letter or a question, you don't remember what the question was. And it was, it was so different than now where someone in Iraq can pick up the phone where he is and check in with home and see if he has any email. It's instantaneous, which means it, it makes the whole frame of reference different. We were really overseas. We were away. Uh, I'm not sure the kids today ever feel they're really that removed. Just as an aside before we get to the next question, the book that Tracy wrote is a combination of his drawings and of the letters that he wrote his wife. And this is available on the Veterans History Project website. A lot of the pictures and a lot of the letters and I read it on the airplane coming up yesterday, and it's fascinating. So I encourage you to go out onto the Veterans History Project website, look for Tracy Sugarman, and uh, you'll find this. It's fascinating reading. Next question. This question is for the gentleman over here on my left. When you landed on Omaha Beach, eventually did you encounter any French resistance people to help with this D-Day invasion of ours? Uh, in case you didn't hear the question, did we encounter any of the French resistance groups? The answer is yes. They were almost waiting there for us to land. They were in great shape, with great strength, and we integrated them as much as we could into with, with us, and we even met, launched an attack with them to go forward, <clears throat> and they were a great help because they knew the land so much better than we did. What other questions? Here's one right over here, this lady. I feel like Oprah. <laughs> okay, here you go. My father was a surgeon attached to the troops that landed on Utah Beach, and one thing I've never understood is how did the medical attachments land? I mean, they didn't come in, I'm assuming, with the frontline troops, did they? I've just never understood, you know, what, where they were in the battlefield, you know, landing on the beach that day. I might be able to answer that better than our medical man on the panel here. They, the aid men that we had were indispensable. That's the word I comes immediately in my mind. They did their job well. They were there when needed and saved many, many, many lives. My hat's off to the medics. And to further carry on on that answer to you, the, the medics went in. Was your father a surgeon? The, the battalion surgeons were not on the front waves, but they were pretty close. And if your father was on Utah Beach, I'd love to talk to you afterwards because my division, the 4th Division, I know a lot of people that were medical on that. Next question. A question for General Angerleiter. First, thank you for your service to the country and to all the others on the panel. General. Thank you. 
General, can you tell us what rank you were at the time, and then secondly, when you hit the beach yourself, and thirdly, if you don't mind, as I understand it, it was the Ranger Battalion that was taking the cliffs on Omaha Beach. How in the world did they ever manage that feat? Let, let me answer the last part of that question first. They had ropes with hooks on them that they could fire up and the hooks would hold on to, to someplace on the cliff and then they just climbed up the rope. I wouldn't want to do that, for sure. They, they did a fantastic job, as did everybody there. And uh, what was the other part of your question? Uh, just what rank, what rank uh, were you I, at the I time? I was a young shave tail out of OCS, six months. A uh, shave tail, for those of you who don't know, is a brand new second lieutenant. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd just like to add a little bit about what it was like on Omaha to go up that cliff. Uh, I was over at Utah Beach, but about 10 days after the invasion, I went over to Omaha Beach because there was an airstrip at the top of the beach and I had to go back and get some material for my cruise. I was 22 years old, I was in good shape, nobody was shooting at me and I was carrying nothing. And it took me 25 minutes just to climb up that cliff. So if you can imagine what it meant under total fire from all sides of the beach for those rangers and those, those army guys to go up is something I have never, never stopped wondering at. Okay, next question. Back at the back. Or oh, you got one here? Okay. Uh, it's, it's been talked about how young you were when D-Day occurred, and also about how it was different, different time and different place. Uh, I'm figuring that 21, 22 year olds in that time, many in their US cities hadn't been to another city, even in the US. What was it like to all of a sudden have to fight this war, go into France for kids that had never even been to the town next door. Let's let a guy who was from West Virginia answer that one. Well, uh, being a hillbilly from West Virginia, I didn't know what was on the other side of the mountain until I got in the Air Force. And it really was, it really was a, an adventure uh, to uh, to suddenly be given the responsibility of flying, a, at that time, a $50,000 airplane that now sells for over a million. Um, in combat, it was character building. It, I grew from a boy to a man overnight. As Churchill said, the biggest thrill in, you can have in life is to be shot at and missed, and I agree with that. Great. Okay, we've got time for about two more questions. The man back here in the back's had his hand up for a long time. This is, sorry, this is for General um, Ungerleiter. I remember reading a lot about uh, Omaha Beach on D-Day and was impressed by the fact that there were individuals who uh, took the initiative to help get the companies off of the beach and up the draws or uh, up the uh, bluffs and um, One particular individual was Brigadier General Norman Coda who I think a lot of people saw um, Display his bravery throughout that uh, morning and I was wondering if you he was assistant division commander I believe of the 29th uh, infantry division and I was wondering if you had any uh, recollection of him or if there were any other particular individuals that you recall who displayed particular acts of heroism to help get people off the beach that day. Uh, General Cotto was the assistant division commander on D-Day. He later got command of other divisions as a major general. Uh, what you heard was true. I think he got the Medal of Honor for what he did on D-Day. He was going up and down the beach. Don't stay here. You, if you're going to get killed, get killed going up the hill. Don't stay here. And that was his favorite saying, don't stay here. And a lot of these young fellows, when a major general says, don't stay here, I, I'm mean, sorry, a brigadier general says, don't stay here, they get up and move. 
Last question, who's gonna ask it? Right here. Then Ellen, I'll let you have one. You're the boss. Um, I just wanted to ask about, you know, I, I know we're supposed to be talking about D-Day, but it seems to me that there's so much more to the story because D-Day was not the end of it. You had still so much to go through from there on. I wonder if anybody wanted to comment about the long struggle to, to get back uh, Normandy from the beach. Say again, I, I didn't hear your last part of that. I uh, just wanted to know if anybody wanted to comment about the long struggle that continued after the beach because you still had to get Normandy back um, from that point. It wasn't just landing, there was so much more after uh, that. Th that is a great question, but we're not gonna answer it because it'll take too long, seriously, because uh, all of them can talk about their experiences for the next, the rest of the war. You were wounded about eight days later, weren't you? On the 20th of June, he was wounded, came back into action. Uh, Bob flew 81 missions. Tracy spent until November on Utah Beach. Then he went on to another ship, ferrying troops. So we don't have time at this hill. But now, Ellen, let's ask your question. Uh, each one of you has told us a story today, and each one of you has told your story that will now become part of history because it's in the archives of the Library of Congress. And I just like some brief reflections on what is it like to share this part of your life with the world 60 years later? Great, Bob Stark. Well, this has been a great thrill. And uh, I think I, I am so convinced that our young people and our future generations should know about World War II. I had the experience in Atlanta of making a talk at a school at which the teacher said she was teaching a class on World War XI. I determined at that time that I had better spend some time teaching people about what really happened in World War II. And I've dedicated many years since the war doing just that. Great. Crazy. Crazy. <clears throat> Well, being here is, is just a, a great joy. And to uh, be able to share a little of uh, what we went through as younger people uh, with older people now is, is really great. It's a particular joy to share it with kids. And whenever I'm invited to a high school or a college or anywhere where there are young people who really want to talk about what the war was not the romance of it, but what it, what it really is like. Uh, I feel a terrible responsibility to say yes, and usually I try to do that. I think it's important that those of us who fought uh, share what that reality of war is about, because the movies are movies. And it's important that those of us who know the truth talk about the truth as we lived it. And I'm very grateful to the Veterans History Project for making me part of that process. Thank you, Tracy. And even though I'm not a World War II vet, I will answer this question myself because as a Vietnam Rifle Platoon leader, I also have my story told and in the Veterans History Project. And I agree with what these gentlemen have said. The education we can give to our young people is very important, so I encourage you Korean War vets, you Vietnam vets, your Somalia, you Desert Storm, your Afghanistan, your Iraq, all of you tell your stories. And equally as important, the home front workers, the wives, the sweethearts, the factory workers, whoever helped in any of our war efforts, get your story preserved. I spent an hour and a half on Tuesday of this week talking to a group of eighth graders uh, for the sixth year in a row about Vietnam, and they're fascinated by it because that's ancient history, and World War II is even more ancient history. Al, what do you think about being part of the Veterans History Project? This is, this is my first experience with your project, being here today. <laughs> I ha I'm sorry I had to say that, but that's true. Fine, go talk into the mic. Yeah. Go ahead and sit, talk. Uh, okay. Whoop. I got to talk fast. She has a sign that says one minute. <laughs> uh, I have.
have to repeat what these gentlemen said, the pleasure that we get out of going to a school or a civic group or any, any organization that's looking for a free speaker that they don't have to pay, they call, they call on us and we always respond because we do get great joy out of it. We feel that World War II is rapidly sinking down into the well of history and if we don't help keep it alive while we're still alive, nobody else will. And I'll keep doing that as long as I'm physically capable. Thank you, Al. And thank you, Bob, and thank you, Tracy. This has been a, an interesting discussion. And grab one of these guys and talk to them later. And once again, before you leave, let me tell you one thing. If you are an American veteran of any war, or if you supported America's veterans in any way, you owe it to yourself, your family, your country to preserve that thread of this great tapestry called American history. So please sign up and get your Veterans History Project interview done. And I'm gonna go interview a Medal of Honor recipient here in 15 minutes. I am thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.